Hello, everyone, and welcome to our live streams. Uh, this is, what, March 18th. We are happy to have you here. And uh, my name is Matthew. I'm one of the uh, course staff, for those of you who have joined us from our courses, uh, for those of you who have come to us from another um, area, we are happy that you found us. Uh, let me explain real quickly how this works, and then I will let Chris uh, say welcome, and uh, then we'll get started with questions. So the way this works is you post your questions in the chat. I will grab them from there. We see all the questions. Please make sure that you post only once. I do try to go in order, but I also jump around to get a variety of topics and to give a variety of people an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe our channel. That way you'll hear about upcoming live sessions. And uh, if you want to find out about live, uh, upcoming live sessions, you can either join our uh, listserv. We have a Google Groups listserv. Um, and I posted that in the chat. Scroll all the way up to the top. And uh, we have a Discord server. And um, I think that, oh, if you uh, prefer to ask questions via email, uh, make sure that you, uh, again, scroll to the top and uh, grab that Gmail address, and you're welcome to send questions that way. Uh, Chris, why don't you welcome everybody, and then we'll get started with questions. Okay, hello, everyone. Um, this is our live session for the online class or anyone who finds us by whatever means. Um, just We'll just get started right away. Floor is open for your questions. Any topic in astronomy? Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, David Wismer would like to know, what would be the impact to the universe if entanglement stopped working? Um, I'm not really sure what its fundamental role is. Well, entanglement, if entanglement suddenly stopped working, it's a little hard to express that since it's a part of quantum mechanics and quantum theory, and so it's part of the theory, and it's unlikely that a part of the theory would suddenly be invalid. Um, but quantum entanglement is a, is a somewhat uh, rare and artificial state. It takes some significant orchestration in the lab to, uh, to take particles down to a level, usually a very low energy level, where you can entangle or couple their quantum states across some distance. Uh, so it doesn't really occur much in everyday life or normal matter. It's a very artificial arrangement, a special arrangement of, of quantum states. Uh, and in that sense, it doesn't have any large role to play in the universe as well as we understand. Excellent, thank you. The next question is from one of our live participants. Um, Faisal would, add, would like to know, uh, when dark objects absorb light, does their mass increase or does any change occur in the nature of those dark objects? So dark objects, it depends really on the nature of the dark object. Um, if it's just a dark object, like a, like, a, a, like a very dark asteroid, I mean, the darkest asteroids have very uh, albedos that are close to that of soot, exactly. So almost all the light is absorbed. So when light is absorbed by a dark physical object like a rock or an asteroid or a comet, uh, then it adds a little energy and heats up the object very slightly. So there is a physical effect. If uh, light impinges on a dark object like a neutron star or a black hole, um, then, then it's less clear what happens. There's no obvious effect on a neutron star for radiation to fall on it, although again, in principle, a tiny amount of energy is added. Uh, and then when light uh, falls into a black hole, I mean, it's, that's essentially gone from the universe. So because of the mass energy equivalence, in principle, the mass of the black hole would increase very slightly if you put radiation into it. It would have to be a very large amount of radiation for that to be even perceptible. The next question is from Einar Jimenez, who asks, uh, good morning, Professor. Um, I have a question about uh, archaeology and astronomy. Do the Nazca lines in Peru have some celestial alignment? Um, the Nazca lines in Peru have been studied for decades, actually. For, they've been known, of course, for centuries, and they're very old. Um, there was a sort of not very well posed theory that they had to be aliens because how could people who lived in the uh, you know hundreds of years ago before modern technology have possibly made such long straight lines across 
of the desert over undulating terrain in, in places. Uh, it's ex actually pretty well known how they could do that. I mean, it's certainly possible using mirrors and capturing light to create straight line objects in the desert. And so it's clear that they were made that way. There have been basically inconclusive studies about the astronomical nature of those lines. They don't display any obvious mapping onto the constellations in the night sky that pass overhead in that part of the world. Um, and so really at the moment it's a bit of a mystery because the people who created them didn't leave any written record of why they did it. Excellent, thank you very much. The next question for today is from one of our live participants, Galaxian Wonder Wanderers asks, is it possible for the universe to contract? It would be possible in principle, and for a while people thought the universe uh, had so much matter in it, especially when dark matter was discovered, that it might uh, overcome the cosmic expansion and then lead to a phase of contraction. And there was even a model called the oscillating universe that had, was in vogue in the 60s and 70s, uh, the idea that the universe would go through multiple expansions and contractions and a series of big bangs. That's all gone out the window because of the discovery of dark energy in the accelerating universe. Uh, so even without dark energy, there was an insufficient mass uh, to close the universe and therefore stop the expansion and turn it into a contraction. And with dark energy causing an accelerating expansion, that's even less likely. The next question is from uh, Basic Vid, who asks, um, "Hi, Professor MP. I was wondering, can someone actually make a notable scientific discovery related to astronomy from their own backyard or terrace using equipment accessible to the general public?" Um, I mean, making a true discovery is is difficult for anyone, even for, for professional astronomers. Uh, however, with the kind of equipment that's available, um, small telescopes with CCDs behind them, by small I mean 6 to 10 inches maybe, mirror size, um, you can actually take reasonable quality data. It very much depends on where you live, of course. If you're in a very urban area or even a suburban area, the sky is probably too bright to do meaningful astronomy measurements. But if you live in a darker place, then certainly from your backyard with a smallish telescope, if you get together with a local amateur astronomer society or check the online uh, posts for citizen science, then you can find projects where you can contribute by perhaps looking for supernovae or monitoring exoplanet transits. That's a challenging observation, but it's done with small telescopes. So the answer is yes, there are uh, projects, citizen science projects typically, where you can contribute meaningfully to scientific research with a small telescope. Making a true discovery, like finding new exoplanets, that's a little harder, and that doesn't happen very often outside professional astronomy. The next question is from Wendy Traver, who sent an email asking, uh, is there something very significant about so many dualities in the universe? For example, matter, antimatter, uh, matter and dark matter, gravity, dark energy, quantum relativity, energy, matter. It's an interesting question. Uh, I've not really thought about that, but it's true. There are a number of physical dualities that we see. Wave-particle duality, that's probably the most profound one because that is an embedded as a foundational principle of quantum theory. Um, so it's equi essentially another way of putting that is there's, there's equivalence between different quantities. So equals, m square, e equals mc squared creates a duality. Uh, between mass and energy because it says they're interchangeable and one can be converted into the other. Uh, so maybe that's the way to think about it, that many of these dualities reflect, reflect equivalences uh, or equations where one type of physical quantity relates to another type of physical quantity. However, sometimes they are not related at all. For instance, dark energy and dark matter, the two dominant components of the universe, that appears to be a duality. Um, but they seem to be physically unrelated. The next question is from Will B, who asks, um, is there a question uh, that you've never been asked here that you'd like to answer, or is there a topic that uh, we've never covered here that <laughs> you think is interesting? That's a good question. So off the top of my head, not obvious, we've been asked a lot of questions. Um, I mean, I would put one out there that I don't think I've been asked, but I can pose it and answer it myself, which is 
will astronomers ever run out of things to observe? Or, you know, or will astronomy as a scientific field run out of steam and, and come to an end? Um, and the answer to that I would give is a definitive no, because astronomy is a discovery science, so most of the things that we talk about and we try to understand were not predicted, uh, and they were found by observations or by accident sometimes. And so, and that's continued even into the modern era. And that coupled with the fact that astronomers are getting more and more powerful tools, whether they're bigger optical telescopes or bigger radio telescopes or gravitational wave detectors that didn't exist 20 years ago, the possibilities for discovery are, are in continuing to increase. And so all of that would lead most astronomers, and not just astronomers who have skin in the game, but, but anyone thinking about it to realize that astronomy is unlikely to, to ever end as a scientific research subject. Thank you very much. Good uh, discussion. Uh, the next question is from Adrian Murray. Is there a database of possible alternate extraterrestrial human forms based on slight genetic variations in the human DNA code? Uh, not that I know of. There, there are certainly uh, geneticists and evolutionary biologists who've looked into what possibilities might emerge from a variation in the human genome. Um, and, and we see natural variations, of course, and mutations. So there is the genetic material of humans does vary from one to another and within populations. Um, but as far as variations that are substantial enough to make an alien, uh, I don't think anyone's ever studied that systematically. And the truth is, uh, for life on another planet, the likelihood that the biology would be similar to ours is quite low. It might be similar in the sense of being based on carbon-based chemistry, but even biologists who study DNA and RNA would say it's not necessary for RNA or DNA to be the code information coding replicating molecule at the basis of other extraterrestrial life. So I think the real issue is that extraterrestrial life is likely to be strange enough compared to terrestrial life that just altering the genetic structure slightly will not probably lead to anything that we ever are going to find out there. Uh, the next question is from an email from Hernan Reyes who asks, um, I read recently that a, an 11th century astrolabe had been rediscovered and identified in a museum in Verona. Um, it had inscriptions not only in Arabic but also in Hebrew and a Latin language. Um, and so this sort of implies cooperation between Muslims, Jews, and Christians in the scientific field. Um, this astrolabe was surely preceded by others, and the astrolabes were said to have been invented by Arab astronomers, but do you know of anything earlier? Did the Greeks have some sort of predecessor um, to the astrolabe before the Arab ones? Uh, yes, the astrolabe does go back a lot earlier than this recent discovery, which I'll talk about in a minute. The, I think the earliest astrolabes were, have been discovered around 2nd century BC, around the time of Hipparchus, so they're Greek, ancient Greek origin. Uh, an astrolabe is a sort of combination of a, a planisphere and a timekeeping piece. It's a you know, physical object that uh, often rendered in brass or some hard metal, and often engraved and often with movable parts. Um, it, it's a sort of a pocket astronomical device of, of quite high quality and quite high precision sometimes. So astrolabes go back over 2,000 years basically. And the astrolabe, you know, had a renaissance, if you like, at the beginning of the renaissance. And 11th century Spain is in, was in fact in many art history books considered the beginning of the renaissance that eventually blossomed in Italy a few centuries later. Uh, this Spain in the 11th century was a melting pot. It was part of the Islamic Empire, um, but it was it had a large Jewish population, so Muslims and Jews and Christians all cohabited and apparently quite harmoniously. And this physical object, this astrolabe that has been around for a while, but has just had recent academic research written on it well, from the place where it was, it's being stored in Verona. Um, indicates the melting pot nature of this culture where the astrolabe had sequential inscriptions in different languages. Um, so it's a very interesting uh, astronomical object, but also a cultural object. 
The next question is from Akshada, who asks, what is nothingness in the universe? And can we define nothingness without being quantitative? Um, astronomers and physicists actually do have ways of defining nothingness. Um, nothingness meaning void, emptiness, no particles, no radiation. Um, so we know about the particles and radiation in the universe, we catalog all the objects, but space-time is essentially nothingness. And so the best example of nothingness that's defined quite precisely in science is space-time. Space-time is described as a manifold, which is a mathematical term for the, the shape of uh, an invisible uh, sort of uh, ambient medium, if you like, of space-time that doesn't have to be filled with anything. And the theory of relativity just describes space-time. And that space-time could have objects and radiation in it, matter and radiation, but it doesn't have to be. It could be empty space-time. And in the original formulation of relativity, uh, that's called de Sitter space, after Wilhelm de Sitter, one of the German theorists who worked on relativity early on in the 1920s and 30s. So yes, nothingness is a very meaningful thing in physics and in cosmology. Uh, and it's the backdrop for all the things that we know that live in the universe, stars, galaxies, radiation, black holes, and so on. Um, so you kind of addressed this uh, question earlier um, about a contracting universe, uh, but Picornin would like to know, can you talk a little bit about what it would be like to live in a universe that was shrinking in size instead of expanding? Uh, would the sky be completely bright, for example? What are some other differences? It sort of depends on what phase of the contraction you're in. Um, if the current universe we live in started to reach a maximum size and then started to contract, we would really not see anything very noticeable because the distance between galaxies is so large. And the most distant galaxies, there's a light travel time issue too, uh, because the most distant galaxies we see um, are seen at large look back times. So we're seeing them in the past. So if the universe started to contract now, the distant objects we see with our telescopes would still be moving apart because the contraction hadn't started for them because we're looking back in time. So that's a, a subtlety of space-time uh, and large light travel time. But if you followed the contraction of a universe further and you lived in that universe, then eventually, yes, the galaxies would all rush towards each other. And eventually, they might appear crowded in the sky. Uh, the sky would start to appear bright from the sum of all those galaxies and at some point of course those galaxies would all merge and at that point there might be real physical effects on the earth or humans or whatever creatures are there to observe this. The next question is from an email from Lauren Rosenthal. Um, why the disparity or why is there a disparity between the mass and the brightness of objects in the early universe? Um, it's not clear the nature of this disparity or the nature of the problem. The, the fundamental issue is that uh, after the Big Bang, it took a hundred or a couple hundred million years for gravitational uh, perturbations, as they're called, or slight, you know, excesses of matter in different regions of space to grow to the point where they collapsed into objects and then formed galaxies and dwarf galaxies combining to form bigger galaxies. And that process takes a while. It's hierarchical structure formation. And so it, it's supposed to take a while in the standard theory to build a big, bright, or massive galaxy. And yet we see some bright and massive galaxies quite early in the universe, getting close to 100, billion years after, 100 million years after the Big Bang. So um, that's the observation that people are puzzling over. But it's not a fundamental problem for theory yet because we simply don't have a very sophisticated theory of how galaxies form. There are many pathways whereby you can build an object from smaller pieces. And there could be mechanisms or regions where that process ex is accelerated. And you're always, your telescopes are going to help you find the earliest, brightest, biggest objects at any given time. So you're going to find them preferentially, even if they're very rare objects. The next question is from Gaetano, um, who asks, hello, I'd like to ask about uh, quantum gravity and the strong force governing the quarks. Um, why or do they have parallel and opposite directions, or can you talk about their relationship, so this quantum gravity and the strong force? Well, they're not directly related. The strong force is part of the standard 
theory of particle physics, standard model of particle physics. It's th it's the force that um, that governs the behavior of quarks, which compose the nucleons, neutrons, and protons, um, and and the mesons. So uh, baryons are three quarks held together, protons and neutrons being an example. Uh, mesons are middle mass particles that are composed of two quarks together. Uh, muon would be an example. And that strong force is well understood and it describes the behavior of quarks whereby they can move small distances but they never actually appear to be liberated from an atomic nucleus. Uh, quantum gravity is something entirely different. Quantum gravity is, a, is an overarching theory that unifies um, the theory of relativity, special and general relativity, and quantum mechanics. And that's a theory we don't yet have. There's various speculations about it. So the strong force is, discovered, is governed by quantum electrodynamics and by um, a quite mature gauge theory of physics. And quantum gravity is a speculative theory that we don't yet know what it is. Excellent, thank you. The next question is from TG, who is with us live. Um, is there any constellation that you can see during an eclipse? Um, it does, there, are, there are a few constellations. You will be able to see the brightest stars in any of the constellations that are in the sky at the time of the eclipse. I mean, it's a good question. But, this, but the sky does not darken sufficiently uh, to really see large numbers of stars. So the eclipse darkens the sky substantially. It also depends on the nature of the eclipse because the varying Earth-Sun and Earth-Moon distances mean that the eclipse doesn't always block the same amount of the sun's light. And so the amount by which the sky around it darkens varies quite a lot between from eclipse to eclipse. Uh, the next question is from David Newmark who sent an email. In the lessons, we talk much about gravity and very little about, about what keeps the celestial bodies away from each other. Um, is it a centrifugal force? Are there other forces involved? Um, mostly what keeps celestial bodies away from each other is the fact that they exist in large regions of space and all of these bodies, all the planets and the moons and the solar system, for example, are, are vastly smaller than the space between them. and so. There's no particular force required to keep objects away from each other. Uh, what's happening is that gravity acts over an infinite range. It's a long-range force going down as the inverse square of the distance. And so it operates over very large distances, and that's usually sufficient to keep objects away from each other. And so collisions in the universe are actually very rare. The next question is from Studio TRX, who's on with us live. Uh, why is, uh, there's a comet called Pons, P-O-N-S, why is it green, and why do people call it the Devil Comet? Um, a green f color in, a, in an object that's vaporizing or has fluorescence or hot gas around it usually comes from the oxygen in it. Uh, so oxygen has transitions, has spectral transitions around 500 nanometers, which is right in the middle of the optical spectrum that the color we would call green. Um, and so any uh, object that has heated gas, it's the oxygen in that gas, which can be vaporizing off the rocks, or because um, uh, these comets do not have atmospheres, uh, but they do have oxygen included in them, and it can boil off in a sense. Um, that's, that's what we're seeing with the, with the green comet. Excellent. Um, the next question is from Terrace, uh, who sent an email. Hi, Professor. It, I've heard that pulsars are very accurate timekeeping devices. Um, is pulsar navigation better than GPS, and could it substitute GPS at any point? That's an interesting question. Pulsars are indeed the most accurate clocks in the universe. Uh, they have variations of time, fractional variations of time registration that are less than one part in a trillion. I think they go down to one part in 10 to the 15, which is one part in a thousand trillion. So they are indeed more accurate than any atomic clock, which is the basis for the GPS system. Uh, the trouble is there's no easy way to harness pulsars to make a practical timekeeping system. Astronomers use them. Uh, they're very well regulated time to do experiments astronomical experiments. 
But if you want to harness pulsars to run a GPS system, you need something more proximate to the Earth. And of course, we have atomic clocks on the Earth, and we can put atomic clocks in orbit. So we have incredibly accurate timekeeping on the Earth and in near-Earth orbit, and that's what runs GPS. And, and then, so I don't think pulsars are going to replace that system. Uh, the next question is also from an email um, from Hernan, who had a second question. The Antikythera mechanism is not an astrolabe, uh, but rather the fir world's first analog computer. Um, what happened in between 200 BC and the 8th century AD when astrolabes, well, so you talked a little bit about when they were invented, but what happened between this time um, when the Antikythera mechanism was invented and when astrolabes were invented, why was such brilliant knowledge leading to the the mechanism apparently lost for centuries only to pop up centuries later? And where did it come back um, into sort of human understanding again? So as I mentioned, um, the astrolabe, the first astrolabes are contemporaneous with the Antikythera mechanism, so about 2,000 years ago. Um, so there were very sophisticated timekeeping and astronomical devices 2,000 years ago. The Antikythera mechanism is substantially more sophisticated than any astrolabe because it's a, it's a, it is an analog computer. It has 57 beveled gears, as I recall. It tracks the nonlinear motions of the planets. It tracks eclipse cycles, the metonic eclipse cycles, and others. Um, and it, you know, it's obviously a very accurate clock, too. It's a mechanical clock. So it didn't have an automatic feature that wound it up and let it run. It was There's a winding mechanism. Um, and it's considered a one-off, but it's unlikely that it was a unique object. It was being carried in a ship that sunk into the Aegean, and that's where it was found a century ago, and then it was figured out much more recently how it worked. Um, why devices like that disappeared for centuries is tied up, of course, with the history of Europe over that time. Uh, when the Greek civilization was replaced by the Roman civilization, certain types of innovations stopped. Um, so while the Romans clearly innovated in, uh, amazingly in technology like aqueducts or in uh, thermal heating mechanisms for their cities and their spas, they didn't do scientific innovation in other areas and they didn't innovate any astronomical or timekeeping sense. And then Europe, uh, with the fall of the Roman Empire in the fifth century, went into the truly dark ages where technology and science essentially didn't happen. And so the emergence of astrolabes in 9th and 10th century Spain and Europe was the rediscovery of knowledge that had been lost, just like the Greek philosophers were rediscovered in that time. Um, so there's a, there's a sort of dead patch of half a millennium or more um, where we really don't see those objects being created for a while. The next question is from Rodrigo, who is from Chile, and says um, it's actually a problem, or is um, our satellites actually a problem to astronomical research programs, um, not only in optical, but also radiant, uh, radio and infrared? Uh, yeah, the constellations of satellites that are being launched by SpaceX and other companies are, are already a problem for research astronomy, and, and that's because uh, especially at sun, near sunrise and sunset, the, the setting sun and rising sun glinting off these satellites and reflecting down to the Earth uh, makes them appear quite bright, as bright as the brightest stars in the sky sometimes, because these objects are, are not very far up. Their orbits are 250 miles up, so very low Earth orbit. Um, so they definitely are t contaminating deep images of the sky made by the biggest telescopes, and that probably will get worse. They also have a certain amount of radio emission, and so radio astronomers have started to notice interference from the satellite constellations. Uh, they don't affect infrared uh, work quite as much because they're cold objects, so they don't glow brightly in the infrared. So to, as I understand it, they're not a particular problem for infrared observing, but they definitely offer optical and radio astronomy. The next question is from Arif, who asks, um, comparing to the timeline of evolution, um, artificial intelligence and its consequences is very much incremental. 
um, what will be the nature of um, of AI on uh, how it affects <clears throat> space, um, research, exploration, all of that stuff. I mean, AI is already having its effect. It's, it's obviously part of astronomy research. Um, as far as how it affects space research or travel in space, that's less clear, although AI is used in engineering circles now to help design objects, could be helped to design more efficient uh, rockets or uh, you know, design structures for living in space uh, that accommodate all the various constraints. I've only seen indications that that's starting to happen, but it's going to happen a lot more in the future. So I think AI is going to be a very powerful tool in, in how we sort of move beyond the Earth and how we do space travel in the future. Um, the next question is from Theo Laub, who um, sent an email asking, um, at any one point in time, you can theoretically draw like a 3D spherical shell around us that um, represents a previous time. Um, so at a radius of one light year, we have a shell as it was one year ago and so on and so forth. Um, how can we consider the shell at uh, 13 billion light years it's a huge shell of huge radius, but the universe is just over one billion light years old since the Big Bang. Certainly not enough time to reach this extensive size. So the the sphere of look back time, which is what the question is alluding to, is an interesting concept. It's true that if you uh, you look out a thousand years, thousand light years, then you're looking back a thousand years into the past. But as you go to large cosmological distances and billions of years you're looking back in time to when the universe was smaller. So it's not a contemporaneous observation. So we can't really think of a set of spheres that are move further and out in space and just get bigger and bigger as you go out. Because what you're doing, of course, is looking back in time when the universe was smaller. And so those spheres will actually reflect that smaller universe back in time. Uh, the next question is from one of our live viewers, uh, Danny asks, could some sort of life like extremophiles and whatnot possibly thrive in the oceans of Europa? Uh, astronomers still speculate there might be life in Europa. There's a recent research result <clears throat> which is indirect observations because we've never sampled the European Ocean. Indirect observations suggest that the European Ocean might be a fairly low oxygen environment. The, the water is not oxygenated by geochemical processes on the seafloor, apparently. And that has diminished slightly uh, the expectation there could be life in the European Ocean because of the lack of dissolved oxygen. Uh, that doesn't mean the oxygen's absent, and it also doesn't mean that there couldn't be extremophiles or biological organisms that could adapt to a sort of low dissolved oxygen state but it has dimmed the excitement over the European Ocean as a place there might be life. Uh, the next question is from Srivatsava who asks, uh, Sir, could you please explain the role of dark matter in the galaxy formation and dynamics? Dark matter is pivotal in galaxy formation and, and how they behave after that because uh, it's the five or six times larger amount of dark matter compared to normal matter that leads to galaxies forming in the first place. In the early universe, which was originally very hot and very smooth, the dark matter eventually starts to form concentrations. Uh, and it's the baryonic material, the normal visible stuff, that falls to the center of those concentrations once they collapse or start to collapse. So dark matter, you know, nucleates galaxies essentially, and, and the galaxies, the visible parts, form at the centers of these large potential wells of dark matter. And then the dynamics of the galaxy are also governed by the dark matter because the way the stellar orbits will go once you have a visible galaxy in the middle of a dark matter halo is their, their orbits and their behaviors and their dynamics are governed by the dark matter because it's five or six times more uh, mass. And so dark matter is really essential for describing any property of a galaxy. The next question is from Neo M who asks, is there mass in gravity? Well, not directly. Gravity is a concept which in relativity 
refers to curved space-time. The agent that causes space-time to be curved is mass and energy. So in that sense, there's a connection. Um, uh, mass and energy curve space and time, basically. That's what general relativity says. Uh, so gravity itself uh, does not invoke mass, but gravity in general relativity is a geometric theory of the curvature of space-time caused by mass and energy. Uh, the next question is from Shireen, who asks, hello there, uh, Earth rotates one degree every day around the sun. Is it because of that that we have 360 days for the year? What about the five extra days and the leap year? Uh, do the four minutes of stars contribute to that? Uh, yes, certainly the, the fact that there is, uh, the Earth moves appears to move at one degree in its orbit around the, um, the sun, 360 degrees in a circle, is, is directly related to the, the way we calculate the year. The solar year is essentially how long it takes the Earth to go from one, any particular place in its orbit to that exact same place one orbit later. Uh, and as we know, there's no reason it would be a whole number of days or a round number or anything. And so that number is 365 and a quarter, very slightly under that quarter. Um, and that's what calendars are designed to match. So yes, it's a very direct relationship between angular scale and how we calculate angles and also time, uh, hours, minutes, and seconds, which is a system of 60s, which gets you to 360 quite easily. Uh, and the way the Earth moves around the sun. The next question is from uh, Blood Muffin, who's on with us live. Uh, would it be possible to sail across the solar system? Uh, certainly, solar sails are the way we might travel to the outer solar system. Sol solar sails have been under development or prototyped for half a century, and they've had some, a couple of notable successes and a couple of notable failures as well. Um, but the, the technology to take a sort of gossamer thin sheet of some substance sort of like mylar that's extremely light and extremely reflective and strong um, and then have light falling on it to accelerate it, um, that's, that's an old idea. It's just very simple physics actually. And in principle, you can use, uh, you get a very low impulse. So un unlike a chemical rocket, which has very high impulse, Solar sails have very low impulse, which means they create rather modest acceleration, but of course it can go for a very long time. It's continuous. You don't have a fuel source. You just have a star, the sun. As you get further, of course, from the sun, the amount of sunlight goes down as the inverse square of the distance. So the impulse delivered to a solar sail reduces as you get further from the sun. And so you, the acceleration will uh, roll over or sort of come to a stop. So really you have to get the object moving as fast as you can when it's still close to the sun and then essentially you're letting it coast into the outer solar system. The next question is from Narasimha who um, would like to know if you can uh, describe <clears throat> the, phenomena, the phenomenon of gravitational lensing and to talk a little bit about its implications for our understanding of dark matter, dark energy, and the distribution of mass in the universe. Yeah, gravitational lensing is a prediction of general relativity. Uh, it was a prediction that wasn't confirmed observationally for a long time. The first lens quasars were discovered in 1979. The theory of general relativity was obviously 1916, and the predictions of lensing happened sort of in the 30s. So it took a long time to observe it. Uh, it's a consequence of the fact that mass bends light, which is foundational to general relativity. Uh, and so the mass bending light can lead to a, a mass lens as opposed to an optical lens, like, like with a, a eyeglasses and so on. It's directly analogous, and the mathematics is actually quite similar. And that lensing can magnify, it can distort the view of a distant object or the, uh, the image of a distant object. It can magnify it and amplify it. It can create multiple images. All of those things can happen. And the lensing is caused by all the mass, not just the visible stuff. And so lensing is a very powerful way of mapping out dark matter. That's essentially how we mapped out dark matter in the universe and also within galaxies. It's slightly more indirect, but it's also used to, to measure dark energy or to talk about dark energy. Because 
the models of lensing across cosmic time are affected by dark energy because they affect the expansion rate of the universe. And so the lensing model has to accommodate how the ex universe has changed size and shape over time. So that's a very, that's a more indirect handle, but basically lensing is a, a foundational tool of astrophysics. The next question is from Sammy, <clears throat> who sent an email. How can a pair of black holes lose their mass in a merger? Is some of the mass lost in the, lost in the form of gravitational potential energy? Does a pair of black holes have less mass if they are further away from each other than if they are close? So when black holes merge uh, in, in to first order and, and mostly, the masses of the black holes combine and produce a, a bigger black hole. However, the violence of that merger the, on space-time means a certain amount of uh, energy is released, gravitational potential energy is released as gravitational waves. And that's, that's a sort of equivalent to losing mass in the combined system. So there's a lot of gravitational waves that are generated by black hole mergers and that those waves are carrying away energy and therefore equivalently they're carrying away mass from the system. So that that's really how the mergers of black holes affect the mass. Excellent, thank you. Um, I also have a quick answer. I looked up the reason that uh, this comet Pons uh, Brooks um, or Comet 12P Pons Brooks is called the Devil Comet I guess is because there was an outburst um, that made it sort of uh, appear sort of um, U-shaped. And right. um, so those horns were sort of, you know, like they, people said they looked like devil horns or something. So I'll post the article in the chat. Um, but yeah. that's why people are calling it the devil comet. And also, I'm sure, because it sells inches in, uh, in newspapers. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the next question... <clears throat> is from Faisal, who would like to know what keeps the universe balanced <clears throat> and why did it not collapse 13.8 billion years ago? Well, the, apparently the reason we live in an expanding or accelerating universe is that there was an sufficient impulse at the time of the Big Bang to create an expansion that would persist. Uh, so there's obviously sort of kinetic energy, if you like, of expansion, and there's a countervailing gravitational potential energy of the attraction of all that mass back onto itself. Um, so this balance was clearly broken in the Big Bang. Now the balance of, that would create a static universe is a very unstable situation. And in fact, that was known very early in the theory, in the development of the theory of general relativity, that, that the galaxy, that Relativity is a sort of dynamic situation where it's far easier and more natural to have an expansion or a contraction than a, than a stable, static universe. That balance required for that is extremely unlikely. The next question is from uh, Andy Verm, who's on with us live, who asks, um, if there could be life on another planet, is there a chance that it could be based on an element that is not carbon, like silicon, for example? Uh, Silicon-based life has been explored by biochemists, and chemists in particular, theoretically, and with some lab experiments. And silicon-based life is, is fairly implausible. It's in, obviously, it's in the same column of the periodic table, so it has, a sim has somewhat similar chemical properties to carbon, but in practice, Silicon's ability to form long, stable chain molecules is, is less good than carbon. It doesn't create as many combinatory possibilities as carbon, and the chemical bonds that form are less stable and less strong than carbon bonds. So as a, as a medium for coding information and building molecules of essentially infinite length, silicon's just not as good. That's not to say that it couldn't happen in an environment where there was, a little, say, a lot more silicon than carbon. It's possible that silicon-based life would evolve and, and, and emerge, but we've seen no hint that that actually happens in the real universe. Uh, the next question is from an email from Wendy Traver. Uh, can you please explain how atoms coalescing into molecules and molecules into elements and a planetary nebula into a planet doesn't violate entropy or the second law of thermodynamics? Well, 
um, the, the growth of structure in the universe uh, doesn't necessarily violate the law of thermodynamics because you have to look at the whole, the overall system. Um, for instance, when stars form, the mass is concentrating. That's a more highly organized form of matter when the mass collapses into an object. But radiation is, is unstructured, and so radiation has high entropy. So as soon as a star is emitting light, you know, it's, it's creating uh, disorder and entropy. And so if you really you look at the whole system or you look at the time evolution of the whole system, in every case you find that the laws of thermodynamics are obeyed, that it, the entropy is actually increasing. Uh, Tomas is on with us live and asks, uh, lately there has been a lot of talk about galaxies that are older than possible thanks to James Webb. What is your opinion on the subject and its effects uh, on the Big Bang Theory? This has been in the media quite a lot and it's not a problem that's gone away, but it's not necessarily um, a problem for the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory has a lot of observational evidence. Galaxies forming too early is really an indication of the fact that we haven't got a good theory of how galaxies form, not an indication that our fundamental cosmology is wrong. So that's, that would be just an overreaction, sort of an inappropriate overreaction, which sometimes happens in the media and some scientists as well. Um, so we just have to figure out uh, with models and simulations the way you can grow a very big galaxy very quickly, including their, the big central mass black hole. And some simulations in the last year or so have shown ways that can happen. So I don't think this is at all raised to the level of an issue where the cosmology will fall because of these observations. Uh, the next question is from Anthony Moore. Are gravity and space-time one and the same? Uh, they are related because gravity is a description in general relativity terms of how space-time curves in response to mass and energy. So in that sense, they're connected. So we have a physical theory of gravity that is entirely a geometric theory of space-time. The next question is from Saman Yu, who asks, how is um, it possible that water is present inside asteroids? Well, there was a lot of material in the formation of the solar system 4.6 billion years ago. Um, and especially in the cooler outer parts, uh, things that we might imagine and experience as liquids on the Earth would be in frozen form. So that would be water in the form of ice, carbon dioxide in the form of dry ice, uh, methane in the form of frozen methane, and so on. Um, so all these gases and liquids are in solid form when they're very cold, and they're not, uh, they're molecules that are quite abundant. They're not as, a, as abundant as the silicates and carbonates that form rocky material, but they're significant concentrations. And so they essentially form within the rock and fro frozen within the rock. And in a comet's case, of course, they get liberated as the comet gets close to the sun and, and there these gases are boiled off. Uh, the next question is from Seraphim, um, who has a question about uh, the speed of light and gravity, there's some assumptions built in. So I'll read the question and we can kind of untangle it a little bit. Um, is the speed of light really the ultimate limit? Uh, but what about the force of gravity? If the gravitational force doesn't have limitations such as speed, wouldn't it make, uh, wouldn't it then be possible to move an object to another place at an infinite speed, uh, but, uh, uh, then also to interact with it in some way gravitationally. So in conventional physics, the speed of light is an absolute limit. Nothing we know travels faster. Uh, in gravity theory, you can make a gravity theory where you conjure up what's called the graviton, which is a spin to subatomic fundamental particle that carries the gravity force. And in that theory, standard model of particle physics, the gravity force would be carried uh, at, at light speed by the graviton. But we've never observed gravitons, and so that's, that's sort of an artificial construct of, of particle physics in the absence of a deeper theory of gravity. So you certainly don't need to invoke gravity operating at light speed. If gravity operates instantaneously, you have a different problem. You sort of have a causality, causality problem, action at a distance. 
Uh, and that's part of why we are still searching for a superior theory of gravity, as good as general relativity is. Uh, the next question is from Amer, who asks, um, would a nuclear attack on the moon have any consequences on Earth's habitability? No, I mean, it's not good to contemplate a nuclear attack anywhere, but if, if for some reason people detonated uh, a nuclear bomb or a device on the moon, and it might not even be an attack on anyone because no one's there, but just to demonstrate the capability, um, it would obviously launch an enormous amount of rocky material and debris and lunar soil in, into deep space. The moon's weak gravity would guarantee that a large amount of material would be ejected from the moon and liberated from its gravity. The moon is still pretty far from the Earth, and the fraction of that material that didn't either fall back onto the moon slowly but drifted towards the Earth would be very small. So in a practical sense, no. The, the explosion itself would have no effect on the Earth, and even the material liberated and liberated from the moon's gravity that might eventually fall onto the Earth would represent a very small fraction of it. Uh, the next question is from Astra Taha. Um, what if the experience of time is just a false feeling and time is just a result of the second law of thermodynamics and is just uh, increasing entropy? Would anything change if this is true? Not necessarily. Um, it is true that the, we do have to reconcile these different aspects of time, the psychological aspect, the inevitable sense that humans and perhaps other sentient creatures on the earth have that time moves forward in one direction. It's a river you can never step into the same river twice because the river is always moving and it never goes backwards. That's our psychological sense of time. Physical time is a little different. Physical time at the subatomic level can clearly flow forward and backward equally easily. And the unidirectional nature of time seems to emerge from characteristic of large numbers of particles or systems where the law of thermodynamics and entropy governs it. Um, so we think that's how, that's how time works. Um, however, there are definitely aspects of time that are completely symmetric at a fundamental level. Excellent. Um, we need to get going a little early today, so we have one final question from one of our participants. Uh, Shireen um, is a water engineer and would like to know if you can talk a little bit about um, water discoveries in space and on planets. Uh, sure, water is one of the more abundant molecules in the universe, maybe the fourth or fifth most abundant molecule. Um, and so there's a lot of water in space. There's a lot of water in astronomical objects. The uh, cool, cold outer regions of solar systems when the nebula collapses lead to frozen water in rocks, and that can be in rocks as small as comets, in rocks as large as asteroids, and in rocks as large as planets. Uh, there's a theory, in fact, that the Earth's oceans uh, were originally in the deep mantle of the Earth, and they, they sort of boiled up or bubbled up through the rock to become the surface oceans we see. The countervailing theory is that uh, that water was dusted from comets and near-Earth asteroids. Either way, it's frozen water in the solar system. We've measured water in distant galaxies, too. There is a water maser line that is visible to radio astronomers, so water can participate in mazing action, which is a relative of the laser mechanism. It's coherent emission from water molecule, and that those lines, those maser lines, have been seen in galaxies several billion light years away. And I think water has actually been detected in in the spectra of galaxies more, like eight or 10 billion light years away. So water is a universal molecule. And so if water is important for life, that's an interesting discovery, because that means that water is available everywhere uh, for when life might need it as it evolves. Um, that's a good question to end with. Water is a fundamental part of astronomy and a lot of good variety today. So thank you for participating. Thanks to Matthew for running the session. And I'm off to India to teach uh, in my Buddhist program with Buddhist nuns, actually, 41 of them from seven or eight nunneries, and we're talking astronomy and cosmology. I'll be there for two weeks, and I think we have a live session the day after I get back on April 3rd. Yes, that is correct. We have a live session April 3rd, and then, um, tr then craziness for the eclipse after that um, in uh, North America. 
Um, anyway, uh, thank you all for joining us. We hope that you have a great uh, rest of your day and we will see you again in a couple of weeks. Take care, everyone.